Good morning all. This case management conference is in the matter of CFI 052 2023 and is being held by way of video conference before Justice Rene Lemire with the sitting of the hearing taking place in Dubai. Any orders or directions made during the course or after this hearing will be issued by the registry in Dubai on the judge's instructions. The claimant is a litigant in person. His instructing counsel is Mr. Peter Lindstedt. The defendant is a self-represented with its counsel, Mr. Doc Mr. D. K. Singh. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Um, now, Mr. Lindstedt, I've seen various correspondence to the registry. I think, as I understand it, the effect of that is that the parties have reached agreement on the directions that should be made. Is that right? That's correct. As far as the directions, uh, yes, as I understand it, those are agreed. And those were sent, well, they're, they're included in the bundle. Yes. Uh, I, I presume you have seen them, but they, I do. Are, they are sitting at uh, page two, two, excuse me, while I wait for my computer to find it. 227. Um, your on your honor if i may say save for yes harrow one uh where i think uh the list of uh, parties uh, neutral parties to be exchanged is two uh, i believe we had proposed three and uh, uh, we believe that if there are three parties nominated it allows in the event of a dispute between the parties uh, a variation for your honour to take an appropriate decision. Mr. Lindstead. Um, we, well, I, I hadn't appreciated that it was not not agreed. Um, yes. Uh, until this moment. Uh, we say two is sufficient. Um, because in, e in every case, the parties need to state, according to the order, need to state their relationship how the mediator is known to them uh, to ensure neutrality in matters of that kind. Um, it, it simply imposes an extra burden on the parties to have to find three who might tick the relevant boxes. And um, so, again, based on my experience of these things, where mediators and available mediators can be quite hard to identify, particularly where, where it's important that they are presented as neutral to the other side, in my experience, two is sufficient. That's why it's there, and that's what we would ask for. Um, but I, I dare say not a lot turns on it. No. Mr Singh? Uh, I, 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 my, my learned friend, Mr Lindstedt, does make a good point. I'm simply putting forward a proposition that it is not within the realm of uh, impossibility that there might be considered uh, self-appointed arbitrators having some subjective aspect to it, which should not be given the fact that they will provide for an impartial uh, uh, declaration. But uh, And I do not believe that nominating three people is going to create any additional burden for the parties. It simply provides, in my mind, some leeway to your honour to say, in the event either of these two parties have objections uh, to their respective nominations, then I have an option to choose either between the three of them, one in any event who will have not been considered as being one or the other. So uh, it, it, it's a practical expedience which I'm suggesting. Uh, I would in the event you're not minded to accept that, I don't have any particular concern. No. Um, the thing, I, I'll leave it as two uh, mediators. Uh, as you know, the process that you've there set out means you've got to agree upon it. If you don't agree, then it comes to me anyway. And, and that might have to lead to somebody else being appointed. But in the first place, I think it might be simpler just to make it two each and and uh, expect that it be sorted. That's absolutely fine, Your Honour. All right. What else, Mr Lindstedt? There's nothing else in the directions. Uh, you you will, uh, I, I presume you've seen my very brief skeleton argument, which simply updated you on, on yeah. where the parties have got to. Um, 
but but the the list of issues contained within the case memorandum is not agreed there are some narrow points uh which well let, which let's deal with these purpose. direction we'll deal with these directions first and yeah. then see what if anything we need to do about the list of issues um i i have just want to confirm some things about these directions. First of all, on your side, Mr. Lindsteed, the intention is to adduce evidence only from the claimant. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. At the moment, that is understood to be the position, and that is what, what's in the uh, information yep. sheet. Uh, it, uh, of course, I, I don't wish to be held to that. There is a possibility uh, of of an additional witness, but I'm uh, that is our position at present. Only death and taxes are certain, Mr. Linstead. Yes. Um, and on your side, Mr. Singh, uh, you presently intend to call six witnesses. Is that right? Uh, Your Honour, again with the same reservation that yes. it is our intention at six. It may be less, it may be more, yes, but not significantly I, more. Yes. That's why I put it that way. Thank you. Um, all right. And that has led you to make an estimate of four to five days. Is that correct for a trial? My view at present is five days is a reasonable and safe estimate for a trial. Right. Uh, so, yes, given the number of witnesses, but also the um, complexity of the issues. Yes, I. My instinct is that at least five days will be required if you're talking about that number of witnesses and there's a, a raft of issues that have to be gone through. So, all right, five days. I mean, the matter can be reviewed at a PTR, but we should work on the basis of five days. Um, now, I think you said uh, I read somewhere uh, that you're not seeking to uh, adduce or to, to take the evidence from any of the witnesses by video link. You intend they should all be in the Dubai courtroom. Is that right? Uh, Your Honour, if I may, that, that is entirely our position. Yes. Uh, this is a particularly one of those cases where uh, cross, uh, evidence and cross-examination are going to be quite material as to yeah, yeah. what, what you, uh, decision you, you need, would take. You needn't persuade me, Mr. Singh. The, um, in, a, in, in a sense, the default position is that a trial of five days would take place in the uh, Dubai courtroom. I, um, I appreciate and, that. And the default That's... position is that the witnesses would give evidence uh, in the courtroom unless there is a reason why they shouldn't, if you uh, would apply from it. So if you both intend... I, I'm content with that, Donald, and thank yeah. you. All right. Um, now that takes me then to... And, Mr Linstead, do you intend that... Uh, you, counsel, will be in the courtroom? Yes. Um, well, I was intrigued why the uh, paragraph 23 of the trial says that it should start at 11 o'clock rather than 10 o'clock. Is there a reason for that? I, on this side, no. That was what appeared in the directions as, as originally drafted by my client. I don't have direct instructions to why that said 11. There is no issue with 10 o'clock. That would be the normal start time. Yeah, it's 11 o'clock sometimes the time when people are in London and it's more oh, hospitable <laughs> hour, but if you're all in Dubai, 10 o'clock is the usual yes. time. All yes. right, Mr. Singh, 10 o'clock. Uh, right. You're on it. I, I think 10 o'clock is absolutely fine, save for one aspect yeah. that we have not yet considered appointing a council, but if we do so in the event of two possibilities, one, the ADR does not provi uh, provide an outcome, and 
when we get down to the witness statement, we take a view that this is far more complicated than we anticipated. We may reserve a right to actually appoint a council. Uh, and if the council is from London, we will approach you if possible at the earliest possible instance uh, that it may start at 11. But I'm content at this stage. Why, why, why would it start at 11, Mr. Singh? Uh, in, in the event, uh, council in London is unable to come. It, well, it, it would be unusual to have a five-day trial in the courtroom with the witnesses in the courtroom and have one counsel appearing remotely. That would be unusual. We would uh, need a... your, your Honour, I completely take your board on point and I'm saying uh, more positively that most likely event will yeah. be that he will be in Dubai. If we do engage a council, all right. Uh, well, pa but, but paragraph simply, twenty-three. Yeah, paragraph sorry. twenty-three will say uh, ten GST, mm. and, and I'm really just for your information, Mr. Singh, saying that uh, if you do engage London Council, I would expect council to be in the courtroom, and if that's not going to be the case, you'd need to make an application and give me good reason why council can't come to Dubai. That's fine, Your Honour. I, I, right. I accept that. Well, that deals with the directions. Now, what are the other issues, Mr Linstead? Um, the parties, as you will be aware, have been trying hard to uh, agree the list of issues. The, right. the case the case memorandum document um, consists of, uh, firstly, uh, a case summary, um, the content of which uh, potentially is, is the, the, the detail of which is, is unimportant in a sense because it's yeah. primarily for your benefit. Um, yeah. But there is, there is also then a set of agreed facts um, and a list of issues. The, the content of the list of issues is more important but because it is effectively the roadmap um, when we're looking at the authorities. It's important for the judge and it's important for the parties in terms of their preparation, which is why its content um, matters. Now, uh, as at last night, we got to a position where uh, the, the, this document was uh, agreed in the main, um, but the defendant put forward uh, a number of additions to it uh, and those additions are not agreed we say it was okay as it as it was um, and so I just need to I need to address you one by one on what those are uh, All right. and why they matter so um, the, the document begins at page 214 yes uh, and there's a very small point in terms of the the yellow text uh, at the bottom of 214. Um, I understand the defendant's position is that they want that to, where, where it is crossed through, they want it to remain in. Um, and it's that is simply a, a clause that says uh, both parties reserve their, their right to come and amend this list of issues. Um, this may be a small point, um, but the claimant doesn't agree to including that. Um, because this is a list of the issues as pleaded, which will determine the, the manner in which the court deals with this going forward. It's not a pleading. The list of issues is not set in stone, but there does, but but including an express reservation to either party to re, to amend it seems to be unhelpful in the context of a document which, according to authorities, is clearly uh, a an important roadmap to the case. So that's why we just asked for that 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 passage to be removed. That's the first Mr. point. Mr Singh? My apologies, I was on uh, mute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I think the position we take is, in a sense, quite simple, and that is uh, the list of issues uh, may arrive within the context of the same pleadings in the event of disclosure and further information that comes to the light of the parties. And therefore, I feel uh, setting the list of issues in stone would not be efficient for the purpose of actually conducting 
decays efficiently. In the event, a list of issues is quite external. It is entirely within your limit, your Lord, to say, sorry, I'm not going to allow this at late stage for X, Y, Z. But to prohibit it at this point of time where no. your primary objective is to, for the conduct of the trial uh, and rather than press the parties to say, oh, look, okay, I want an absolute list of agreed issues, which is absolutely not provided for in the rules, would be uh, basically stifling our position in relation to how we then progress the case. Yes. The, the reservation is not necessary. The list of issues is to be a list of issues that the parties have arrived at now. If there is... Uh, if it emerges there is some other issue or something else you wish to put in, Mr Singh, then uh, you do so at the time. Removing that, uh, um, removing that note is not, I think your word were, making it absolute or um, removing any possibility of additional issues being added. It's simply to make it a simpler document and, and, and not to complicate things. It's a list of the issues as you see them uh, today. If something emerges, then you can seek to change I, it. I, I appreciate that, Honor. I'm simply uh, trying to, right. let's say, foreclose the possibility of a new list of issues arising and the other side then objecting to it and then compelling us to make an application on that basis, which, if otherwise I contend, would arise naturally from the pleaded position and in light of new factual evidence. So it does not do any prejudice to them. Uh, the, your, your case management power allows you to control it in any way. So if it doesn't no harm to them, and it might actually be of benefit to them, I, I do not see how that provision inclusion at this stage could either affect how you conduct the case or affect them prejudicially, or affect us prejudicially. Yes, um, the, the, that note will come out. It simply, in my view, it simply complicates things. Um, not having the note in doesn't have the effects that you fear, Dr Singh. It doesn't preclude amendments or anything of that sort. But to put it in is, in my view, just complicates things, so it'll come out. What's next? Uh, the next part of the document is the case summary. Uh, although uh, the claimant is not necessarily happy with uh, certain small additions, I'm not going to take up the court's time with that. We'll simply accept them because it is merely a case summary. It's not. It's not a pleading. Um, no. I move on. I, I move on then to section B, which is uh, the heading is facts not in dispute. This is a page two one nine, uh, and. There are three parts uh, of this. Um, it, it's simply the, the track changes, uh, firstly at the bottom of page 219. Um, the, the section at J, and bear in mind the heading here is facts not in dispute, so this is master's agreement. Well, I was about to say, I, I, I don't want to be grumpy, but they're either in dispute or they're not in dispute. Um. Yeah, indeed. So if I can... The short point is, on all three of the points, in fact, not in dispute, uh, it's the claimant's position, as has already been outlined to the defendant, that we don't agree the matters they want to amend in. Um, we say that's the end of the matter. I can go through them individually. If, no, if I... no uh, Mr Singh's going to have to tell me why. Uh, as I said, it's matters not in dispute. If the claimant disputes them, then they're no longer not in dispute. I don't know how we can argue about it, really, Mr. Singh. Ah, uh, you're on mute, Mr. Singh. My apologies again. <laughs> <You're> not... <laughs> yes. uh, I, I think the position in my mind is uh, just going back to the rules at 26.13 as to what your objective is. Yes. Uh, so I, I think uh, what requires to be done is not only the claimant's list of issues, but the defendant's list of issues in opposition or 
uh, as an alternative explanation should be there. Uh, otherwise, it simply becomes a one-sided uh, list of issues. What the claimant says is to be determined by, by the judge. Uh, if later on, if I try to reframe this list of issues, I go back to I'm the sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we might be at cross purposes. Mr. Linstead took me to section B, B1, facts not in dispute. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yes. Uh, so he referred to, I think, para J, if I'm not mistaken. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the addition, in my mind, is not a fact in dispute. It, but it is. It is disputed. It's asserted in the defence. Um, there isn't a reply. It's not accepted. And it, that, we say that's an end of the matter. It, it, well, it is factually disputed. The assertion put in, in, the, uh, in the track change is factually disputed. Well, let me just read it. All right, so the bits in blue are matters which you assert, Mr. Singh, and the complaint and the claimant says he doesn't agree with them. How can they not be in dispute? Right, uh, you're on it. I, I think maybe one simpler way of dealing with this. If learning council says they are in dispute, we'll simply move that point into facts which are in dispute and not in yes. dispute. Thank you. I, I, okay. I'm content with that. And does the same apply to uh, what used to be O, but seems to have lost a letter? But yes. Oh, it's part the of same, O, is it? The same applies to that. It's the blue writing. Blue writing. So the, well, again, the, the, same the, point, Mr. Singh. If it's in dispute, it's yeah. in dispute. It uh, can shift places. But um, you're on it. If, I mean, I, I do believe that it is not in dispute because it's all a matter of documentary evidence. But nevertheless, Mr. Peter Lindstedt says, yeah. I do not accept it. Then we move it into matters which are in dispute. Yes. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. All right. What next, Mr. Lindstedt? Um, well, just to be clear, that, that, that applies to all the blue writing on this section, but I think that's been made clear. So yes. next, we look at the list. The, the list of issues under B2 begins at page 220. Uh, the first uh, is at uh, page. Could you two, please two, tell me the page number? 221. Oh, thank you. Um, now, this is, it's actually not, this is not in blue, but it, it was originally highlighted yellow. Um, uh, it's come out on different colour on the PDF. So this is the top of 221. Yeah. At the end of this section, and this is dealing with the defendant's argument on limitation. Yeah. The final, it's the final sentence of that, which is disputed. It's disputed that it is an issue. We say simply that the defendant has made a mistake. It's a drafting error by the defendant, according to, uh, in relation to what its own defence says. So defence asserts the limitation point uh, and uh, specifically it says that um, in this sentence it says that acts relied on by the claimant before the 19th of June 2022 are time barred but that's not their pleaded case and it, the, the problem is the date the 19th of June 2022. Um, I need for this to take you to the defence your honour and that's the page 73 of the bundle. And we're looking at paragraph 9.3 of the defence. Now, I mean, can you, I assume you've got there. Yes, I do. Uh, so 9.3 says safe for act of termination of employment for cause on the 19th of December, um, all other acts or, or conduct or omissions complained of uh, uh, 
occur, it should say which occur six months prior to the 19th of June, uh, 2023 has extended to the 19th of July. Then after the brackets are therefore time barred. So the pleaded case is that it's events occurring six months prior to, more than six months prior to the 19th of June. Um, and that date is then the 19th of December, 2022. That's mm -hmm. what's pleaded. And one can understand, I mean, we, we say they're, they're wrong as a matter of law, but um, one can understand the argument there. But what has been added to the list of issues is not that, it's putting that date forward by six months and says uh, that the acts relied on before the 19th of June 2022 are time barred. It should be uh, before six months prior to June, 19th June 2022. That's a pleaded case. And indeed, we don't need the sentence because that's already been included in the list of issues, which is agreed. But uh, at the top of the same paragraph at 1C, it says claims what arising. Page, what page is that on again? Page 220 Eight. of the Eight. bundle. Eight. The, the, def yeah. the, the yes. defence page uh, is page 73. I, I've seen the defence. I meant the the list of yeah. issues. The, page 220 of the bundle at 1C. Yes, so that's the pleaded position referring to events prior to yep. 19 December 22. Correct. And then the additional sentence. Yes, well, Mr Singh, seems to be a mistake, isn't it? Uh, Your Honour, our position uh, is, is simply uh, stated in paragraph 9.3 at page 79, and that is, if... Or although there is a typo, it should not be 19 December 2024. Uh, the termination I, of further. I'm sorry, I better go back to what page 70? Uh, sorry, page 73, uh, para 9.3. Right. Uh, and the simple point we are making is in the event the alleged point of discrimination, uh, the alleged allegation of discrimination has been made. Uh, uh, before 19, 20, 19, uh, after 19 December 2024, it should have been made within six months, which was not the case. Now, that's quite a separate point in terms of... I'm, I'm sorry, so, I'm sorry, you go to 9.3, yes, so that presumably is, you say that should be 19 December 2023? That's correct. So, uh, um, and, so he was terminated on 19 December 23? So therefore, he has a six-month window thereafter, which expires on 19 June, uh, within which he must put forward his allegations of discrimination. But what you decided was a completely different point, is in the event he's gone to CSD and come back to CFI, he cannot be deprived of his right to bring a claim. The right to bring a claim is quite distinct from right to enforce a cause of action. That that is the distinction we are making. But I think the point that Mr. Lindstead was making was what you say in nine point three is all other acts or conduct or omissions complained of occurring six months prior to nineteen June. So yes. that well, yes. six months prior to nineteen June oh, is nineteen three, December. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Your Honour. My, my, the position we are setting up is he is terminated on 19 December 2023. Yes. He alleges acts of discrimination prior to that termination. Obviously, after. Uh, just to give you a bit of a background. Well, no, uh, no, no. Let's just take this point. No, uh, so he's it, alleging sorry, acts of uh, Your Honour, I, I, I think if I just give me. Literally two minutes. Uh, this will All right, but I'm going to let you do this. But the point I want to make is, I want to come to the point, not not. No, indeed, some... it, it is precisely right. to the point. It is precisely right. to the point. Uh, Mr. Andrew, uh, the the claimant, did not attend office from 16 September thereafter at all, until we terminated him on 19 December. He was not even in office. 
So what we are saying is, if uh, after his notice of discrimination, uh, he, after his notice of resignation, if there are any acts of discrimination, and we terminate him on 19 December, they should be before you within six months. That is our simple point. Yeah, if he has not done that... Sorry, sorry let that, me, I just want to say what you're saying. Within six months of 19 December 23. Yes, sir. But, but that's not what 9.3 says. So, um, uh, I, I believe it does, but if it well, doesn't... You're going to have to educate me in English. It says, all other acts or conduct or omissions complained of occur six months prior to 19 June. Well, six months prior to 19 June is 19 you, December. So you, all acts... You, Your Honour, I, I, I take your point fully, and, and it should have been prior to... 19 December. Right. Yeah, so, I thought my apologies. Right, we're, so we're you're going to have to amend 9.3. 9 indeed, indeed. Uh, my, my apologies, that, that should have been 19 December. Your Honour, that just takes By me the back. 19 December. If, if I may, that takes me back to my original point, which is we, don't, we then don't need the sentence because that point is already made expressly at 1C at the bottom of page 220, which says that claims arising prior to the 19th of December are out of time, or time barred. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that seems right, Mr. Singh. You've already said it in C. Uh uh, Your Honour, if it has already been said in C and there is a mistake in 9.3, what we can elect to do is uh, amend the pleadings to that short extent. Yes, you can, but I think Mr Linstead, in a sense, is um, treating it as already being amended. He's, he's, well, treating, uh, he's treating your argument as being... Well, sorry, I'll start that again. What you say in paragraph C is uh, any the events occurring prior to 19 December are time barred. Now, that's not what paragraph 9.3 of the defence says, but Mr. Leinstead, I think, is accepting as that's what you meant to say in paragraph 9.3. Um, but you've said it in paragraph C of your issues, so you don't need that extra sentence at the end of, at the top of page 221, do you? Uh, to, uh, Your Honour, I think uh, to resolve this issue rather than here and now, yeah. if you will permit us, uh, is to go back and consider Mr Linstead's position and reframe it, uh, if necessary, make an application to do so. Yeah, but just be clear, what is para is that sentence? As such, the court is invited to consider the claims individually, such that those acts relied on by C before 19 June 22 are time barred. Um, what's the, is that saying something in addition to what's in paragraph C at the, uh, at the bottom of 220? Um, Your Honour, I, I, I mean, I've sort of not delved into the details of uh, on this particular position. Uh, so I, I would seek your indulgence in terms of applying a mind to it before we put a more specific uh, position such that Mr. Well, Pitt and I, I don't want to spend I, I, I don't want to spend time and money on something which is pretty insignificant. Um, well, uh, your, your Lord, uh, it is insignificant. O only if you consider that our case in relation to advancing a further time barred argument is hopeless. Uh, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying, Mr. Singh. You've already said in paragraph 1C, any other claims arising prior to 19 December 22, the date of termination of employment, well, um, are, t are time barred. You just seem to be saying the same thing again in the last sentence. Uh, I'm not it, trying to cut you out from anything, but just trying to make it simpler. I'm, I'm sure, Honour, you're not. 
well, if may, maybe the way to look at it is yeah. it, rather than clumping all of the incident in, in, in one particular box, uh, if you look at it from the fact that limitation could also be an issue, if each act was considered individually, then it might make more sense. All right. Mr. Lynch, does it matter? Um, well, it, it does matter because it, it, it's, the list of issues must reflect the pleaded case. Yes. The date of the pleaded case, uh, except there's a typo in it, but the date in the pleaded case is the 19th of December. Um, i.e. six months prior to the 19th of June. That's what this should reflect. Um, but do you accept that that's not what is intended, that they intended to say six months before December 23, which is June of 22? The six-month period that Mr Singh is talking about, and I'm not saying that it's right, but the six month period he's talking about is six months prior to the date of termination, isn't it? And Linstead says, no, that is not correct. Yeah, no, but you, but the, the defendant, the defendant. The, the, no, forgive me, uh, Your Honour. My understanding of the, def the limitation defense yeah. I've pleaded is not that it's, you can't bring claim six months, you can't bring a claim which arises more than six months prior to the date of termination. My understanding is that if you can't bring a claim that arises more than six months prior to the date of issue of the proceedings, that would follow from the limitation provisions in part nine. Um, that's that's an, an obvious point, and that is what the, clearly from the pleading what the defendant is saying. I see. Um, and the date six months prior to the uh, date of issue is six months prior to the 19th of June 2023, which was the date of issue. Um, and that is indeed our point. Um, now, fine, well then there's no dispute about that, but then the sentence is wrong because it doesn't say six, six months prior to the 19th of June 20... Uh, six months prior, sorry, it doesn't say six months prior to the 19th of June 2023. It simply says the 19th of June 2020, before 19th of June 2022. Mr. Singh? Uh, sorry, if I may just take quick instructions, if you don't mind. All right. Your Honour, if if uh, the Learning Council for the claimant accepts that uh, Para 9.3 on page 73 is not an issue, but it is an issue uh, in the case memorandum, I'm just trying to figure out which paragraph is he referring to. Just, just so that I am clear as to what my answer should be. I'm referring to paragraph 9.3. And I'm uh, saying that that is the defence, and that is not what's reflected in the wording in the final sentence of paragraph one at the top of page 221. So, uh, on paragraph one on page 221, uh, you, you mean... Paragraph one, starting under the heading limitation. I'm talking about the highlighted sentence at the end of paragraph one at the top. Of I page see, one, uh, the which is as such, the court is invited to consider the claims individually, such that uh, acts before 19 June are time barred. Is that the sentence you're referring to? Yes.
Sorry, Yona, um, apologies for the interrupt interruptions. The, the position we are taking flowing from 9.3, uh, and that is uh, the claimant alleges certain, uh, several or certain individual acts. Those certain or several individual acts will fall to be decided separately in terms of limitation. And we say as between 19 December 23 and 19 June 2023, limitation will apply depending on when he al alleges the discrimination has happened. And I think the 9.3 9 to that extent is consistent with what is provided in, in the case management sheet. And, and so therefore, uh, his, uh, my learned friends comment uh, that it is covered at para 23C is not entirely correct because the way we are suggesting that is quite different. I know. What is the limitation point you're making, Mr. Singh? When, when do you I'll, say it? Uh, it, it okay. Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. Let, let's say the claimant alleges that an event of discrimination happened on, say, 4th September 2023. The question that would arise would be, what is your point of limitation from that of date of discrimination and him bringing a complaint to that effect? That would be six months. So that would fall somewhere between 19 December and 19 June, uh, but within six months. For, for, for instance, if you look at the 4th of April like, and apply that logic, then... But how do you, how do you get to 19 June 2022? Uh, the... when, was, when was the claim brought? I know there's an argument about it, but on the two views. When do you say it was brought? When was the claim brought? Uh, in 2023, your lord. Yeah, when? Uh, one second. I, I just have a picture. Uh, that is uh, 25th July 2023 is the date on which it is issued. Now, that, that's talking about, is that the CFI or the SCT? That would be the SCT, your lord. Okay, 25 July of 23. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So what, what's uh, your point? Could, that sorry, can't... Could I assist? sorry, sorry, the C SCT date is um, 60, uh, 15 June 2023 and CFI date is 25th July 2023. My apologies. All right. So 15 June 2023 is the date on which the SCT claim was brought. And that seems yeah. to be, um, well, I don't know where 19 June and 19 December comes in then. Where, where do we get 19 of June and 19 of December? Uh, I, I think the limitation point is being argued in the context of claims being brought in the CFI 
uh, insofar as, let's say, you have alleging a claim of discrimination, which, which uh, has been referred to the CFI. So the question is, can the claimant then still pursue that claim? And, the, the, and, and, and you have to refer it back to the date of termination, the date of termination being 19 December 2023. So, right. so, the, so you, your limitation would effectively start running from that day. From which day? 19 December 2023, your Lord. All right. So why are we concerned with 19 December 22 and 19 June 22? Should be 22. Didn't get that. Uh, you know, uh, he is terminated on 19 December 2023 and claim. Uh, when is the SCT claim? 15 June 2023. So uh, 22 is not in play, Your Lord, if I'm mistaken. The, what is in play is 19 December 2023, uh, 15 June 2023, when he brings an SCP claim, and 25 July 23, when he brings a uh, CFI claim. Those are the relevant dates. Well, I must say, I'm totally confused. It seems now that neither. 1C nor the extra sentence are, are what you're really saying. Is that right? Right. Um, Your Honour, I, I, I think I've made my point. Uh, if, if you're not. Well, I haven't understood it, Mr. Singh. Can you have another go? <laughs> what dates should they be? The, well, the, the simple point we are taking in one instance is this. Uh, there are a series of events and a and, uh, series of conduct issues prior to 19 December 2023. The events being where he alleges that I, I was discriminated against. Conduct where the firm is alleging his conduct is bad. Now, the, so th they're all happening before 19 December 2023. On 19 December and on 9th June, 2023 he gives notice of termination, uh, alleging that he will bring a part nine claim. So he's fully aware of the fact that if an incident happens after 9 June, he will be entitled to bring a discrimination claim. He gets terminated on 19 December. So if his notice is 9th June, and then he alleges an act of discrimination, say in September, he, he would be aware that from the date of that allegation, his uh, time period would expire within six months of that. But because there are a series of individual events, the position we are taking is he had six months after 19 June in any event. Uh, 19 June 23. 19 December, sorry. 19 right. December in any event for to bring All any right. discrimination claim. So, but that is the point we are trying to make. So what should 1C say and what should the last sentence at the top of page 221 say? Uh, if, if you will allow me a couple of minutes, I can just reformulate it and bring it back to you. All right. Thank you. Well, look, I, I, I don't want to spend no. large amounts of time and money on what really uh, I'm not the, sure is that important. It, it is not our intention, Your Honour. We are simply trying to put forward a position that a particular uh, claim for time bar is available to us. And if you're not satisfied entirely with our explanation, obviously it lies within your discretion to say, uh, I'm not convinced that will not be allowed. Uh, but if allowed to sort of put forward a nuanced proposition and say, uh, I am prepared to consider it, then that will be the end of it. I, well, I don't I just, know what it is, Mr. May, may I interject? My aim is simply to try and cut through matters and cut matters short. The claim was issued um, on the 15th of June 2023 in the Small Claims Tribunal. Right. Um, 
the effect of your order in April was that the time was time was extended to allow the claim, which was then brought in the CFI on the 25th of July. But the issue date was um, 15 June, still, still the 15th of June. Yes. So limitation must have started running from the point six months prior to the 15th of June 23 which is the 15th of December 2022. It appears there's an error in the, well, potentially in the pleading or in the list of issues because they've relied on the 19th of December. I'm sure that that's is not going to be a problem if it's in, if it's now stated that that was a mistake and it was meant to say the 15th. But I think the sum of, the sum of what, I what I understand the defendant's position to be is that when in the list of issues at 1C, it says claims arising prior to the, 15, the 19th of December 2022 are out of time. It should it should state claims arising prior to the 15th of December 22 are out of time. Um, that 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 would then be applying the statutory limitation period with a view to the date when the claim was actually issued. There couldn't be right. any other way of arguing it. Right. We're still in then in a position where the further sentence at the end of paragraph one is is unnecessary. Um, and it's different. And the problem with that final sentence is it, it brings the date, well, it gives us a different date, which is simply, yeah. simply correct. It has no, that date simply has no basis in law or fact. No. So the relevant date, should be 15 December 22. That's paragraph 1C should be changed to read 15 December 22. And the last sentence really is unnecessary, but if, frankly, if the defendant wants it, they can have it, but it should be 15 December 22, not 19 June. Is that right, Mr. Lindstedt? That's that's certainly my understanding of the defence. Yeah, uh, Mr. Singh. Yes, Your Good. Honour. I, I, I've heard what my learned friend said. What, what I would like to do is just take you back to page twenty-one of uh, of the defence. The twenty-one. Bundle, the yeah, uh, I'm just giving you a simple example as to how we. Well, I don't want an example. I want to know what it is you're saying. Well, you, well. You uh, need to before, just a minute, Mr. Singh, before you justify it, I want to know what it is you're saying. That's precisely what I'm trying to do, Your Honour. All right. Uh, on, page, on paragraph 21, page 21, I'm saying, on the afternoon of 4.25, the male, a male practicing Muslim observing Ramadan, etc., etc., yep. says, is the right, uh, is the action which allowed him to bring a claim of discrimination. Our, my position is, if that is the alleged act which allows him a claim of discrimination, he must do so within six months of that alleged act. And right. so you will have a series sequence of acts, and the last act on which he can claim he's been discriminated and or victimized is the termination event, that is 19 December 2022. So therefore, what follows that for the purpose of limitation, you will, you will have to consider both individually and collectively as to when the term, uh, limitation applies. All right. So that, that, that is what we are trying to say. But the date should be 15 December 22 on your case, that, isn't it? But that would be the last uh, act which he says is a discriminatory act. So his, his first discriminatory act, he says, is 4th April 2022. And then he goes on to say his termination for cause, which we say is valid, he says is an act of discrimination and the victimization. So you will then have to assess of these several acts. When I look at the underlying evidence, is it, hell, uh, is it time barred or is it not time barred? Yes, but what date? You say in paragraph 1C on page 220, uh, you, claims you, arising prior to 19 December 22, and then at the end of the paragraph, you say before 19 June 22. Why are they different? 
uh, Your Honor, that the 19th June comes into play if, as I said, sorry, if I have to repeat this again, there are series of incidents which he claims are incidents of discrimination. His last uh, claim of incident of discrimination occurs on 19 December. So you apply the act, then he would be allowed six months from 19 December, that is 19 June, to say, I've been discriminated against in relation to that particular cause of action. But if, I, if he says, I've also been discriminated on 4th April on account of my race, religion, sex, etc., then that limitation cannot be the same for the purpose of your decision as the act of termination which happened on 19 December, because this is not a single spectrum. These are series of discrete events which he says are discriminatory. Mr. So Linstead, if there are five Mr. acts... Okay, that's enough. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Mr. Linstead, Sorry, frankly, but, I've just had enough of this. Um, the, the, the introduction is the defendant contends, and, and frankly, they can put, if that's what they want to say, they contend. If we get, if and when we get to the trial, um, they're going to have to open their case and they're going to have to make their contentions and they're going to have to relate them to their pleadings. If, if the contention doesn't fit with the pleading, then that'll be their problem at trial. But, but frankly, I don't want to spend any more of the court's time and your client's money going around in circles with this. Yes. Uh, thank you, Your Honour. Um, there is just one other aspect of the list of issues, uh, which is in contention. Uh, and this is uh, at page 224. And it's paragraph 14. Yes. And the heading that's been put in is conduct of the claimant during the course of his employment. So let me just understand the context. This is still, this is um, matters what this is, what the defendant contends or what? Yeah, this is, this is all, this whole section in, in blue. Yeah. Uh, at the bottom of 224, go over the page, uh, which is all under paragraph 14, is all the, what the defendant contends because okay. it, each each paragraph is ended with D contends that. Yes, this is okay. a section which was added by the defendant yesterday uh, afternoon on, in the draft. Right. You see, you hadn't seen it before. Um, the, the, the difficulty with this is that this is uh, a number of uh, references to the conduct of the claimant during the course of his employment. Yep. The claimant's conduct during the course of his employment is not a freestanding issue before the tribunal. The, the issues before the court are the legal issues which have been carefully set out. They are it's the it's the claimant's claims and potentially the list of issues would include that it could include the defendant's responses to those individual claims. Um, they're set out faithfully in the list of issues taken from the particulars of the claim. Um, but, but what there isn't in the defence is a freestanding uh, section on the defendant's, on the claimant's conduct. Um, and in any event, um, matters in the list of issues need to relate to the specific issues that the court has to decide, i.e., was the claimant discriminated against um, in the various ways alleged uh, on the various dates? And um, so the difficulty is, it, this is, although aspects of uh, that section of paragraph 14 are drawn from various references in the pleadings, um, this isn't a freestanding issue which the court has to determine at trial. And the concern of the claimant mm. is that this is setting up um, a series of criticisms of the claimant um, of both of his conduct and performance um, as, as a freestanding issue, effectively a character assassination, by adding a section to the list of issues, when in fact those points, although individual points can be raised in response to individual allegations, it, that is not an issue between the parties. The issues are the claims brought by the claimant and the individual responses of the defendant to those claims. So that's the, that's the overall point. But um, just to break that down, 
um, looking at the uh, the subparagraphs under 14. First of all, it says D contends that the claimant's conduct and performance during the course of his employment um, and up to date he offered his resignation. Uh, demonstrated a pattern of behaviour which was disruptive, causing a bad working environment and inefficiency. Um, now, it, it's right that there are various references in the defence of the claimant's behaviour. There is not a general reference to it um, as, as it's set out in a list of issues, i.e. that the defendant's behaviour throughout his employment was disruptive and it caused a bad working environment. Um, that that is simply a, an assertion made by the defendant in the list of issues uh, to tarnish the claimant, but it's not an issue for the court. In so far as the claimant's conduct is an issue, then it has to be put against a particular uh, specific allegation. So that's that's that point. If I jump to um, th little three, created a hostile working environment for senior female employees. The context in which that's raised in the in the defence is uh, that there is an allegation of bad faith, and that is in the it's at page seventy five in the defence, and we're looking at paragraph thirteen point six. Sorry, what page? Uh, page seventy five. Thirteen point six. Pattern of problem. Uh, I'm sorry. My, uh, I'm sorry, that might be, sorry, forgive me, it's paragraph 13, my apologies. The, I 13. think the page is correct. Paragraph 13. Page 13. I'll start page again. 13. Sorry, Mr. Lynn said, say um, it again, page. It's, it's paragraph 13 of the defence. And that's under good faith point. allegations. Yeah. Um, forgive me while I just get that page up. Now, that's it. Uh, it begins with any good faith allegations. And what what's asserted there is that um, as the claims of victimization, the claimant evidence presented by the claimant uh, to support it is in bad faith and as such ought not to be protected under the law. So that's that is the legally pleaded point. Um, we say it's a bad point. It doesn't mean anything, but nevertheless, I don't know what, what what's it saying. He, your the claimant alleges acts of victimisation. The yes. defendant says it didn't victimise. Yeah, it's a it's a denial. But the, the, a further point is made that it's not entitled to protection. Now, I don't inside need to what argue. protection? I, I don't, well, I don't know, but I don't need, we say it, it, it doesn't legally mean anything. I'm not, I'm not objecting on that basis at this right. point. Um, if the defendant wants to make that point, it can. My point is this, that under the good faith allegations, it sets out, it does make reference, a paragraph 13.6 on the next page, um, to allegations about inappropriate behaviours um, towards senior female colleagues. So that's there. But the context of that is that it's said to be um, a matter relied on um, to show bad faith. And we can see that if you go back to paragraph 13 on page 75, hmm. uh, towards the end of that paragraph, um, it says a defendant relies on the matters pleaded herein, uh, generally, but more specifically, the following matters. Um, and the claimant has put strict proof. So it's one of the matters relied on to go to this bad faith point. That's the context of allegations, that the allegations in relation to senior colleagues. Um, but here it's it's simply extracted and put in a list of um, conduct of the claimant during the course of his employment, um, which again is not, that's not the issue before the court. Um, so it's it's not the place of a list of issues simply to make assertions by the defendant about the claimant's character and conduct unless they go to an issue. Um, the same point can be made about uh, the final bullet point on page 224, which is 14 little 4, 
he failed to improve his conduct or performance in spite of formal and informal reviews about his work and conduct. Um, now, there is only one reference in the defence to the claimant failing to improve his performance and conduct. That is at page 90, it's paragraph 40.5. Um, which is making the assertion that can I can I go back I'm sorry soon said it must be the time of day can I go back to some very basic things what's the claimant's claim the claimant's claim is that he was discriminated against uh, under both Article 59, yes. which is discrimination and and I'll call it harassment for want of yep. a better word. Those two two different provisions of 59. Right. And under 60, he was victimized, which is also part of the uh, part nine of discrimination provisions. Right. Um, uh, the victimization is in response to his protected act, which is um, indicating okay. that he was going to bring a claim against the, the, the defendant. So that's those are his claims, and those, those he, are the he, he doesn't claim unlawful termination. No, he he doesn't. He says that the termination was an act of victimization, but right. it's not a um, it's not a termination based claim. Right. So that I mean that's a summary. Um, so so the the points that you've been taking me to in the defence yeah. are points in answer to alleged acts of discrimination. Yes, to specific it's acts. Not, it's not a justification of, of termination, but a case where the claimant says I was wrongfully dismissed and the defendant says, no, we had proper grounds for termination. These are what they were. It's correct that that is not what this case is about. However, it is fair to say that the defendant says that the, the, the termination was an act of victimization. So it's yeah. one of the discriminatory acts. And therefore, the reason for the determination is an issue. That would be fair. Right. Point. Um, but, but the point being made here is um, I don't need to go through all these particulars. It applies both to the matters at the bottom of page 224 and 225, that they are individual points which have been plucked out of the defense and put right. together in this section, which is attacking the claimant's character. Um, and that's not that's not actually properly an issue before the court. It's not a, a subset of issues on which evidence needs to be given. It's only in relation to individual allegations that those points can be made. Insofar as these points are in the de uh, defense, um, they are part of that bad faith allegation, which we say is wrong in law, the defendant disagrees, but that's, it's in there. And that's already dealt with in the list of issues. Where, fact, where for example, the, were they dealt with? In the next paragraph, um, uh, paragraph 16 on, on page 225, uh, under no, the, yeah, out, it says the defendant contends that claims, the victimization claims are made in bad faith. Um, for the reasons set out in paragraph 13 of the defence, and as such, ought not to be protected under the law. So that that's dealt with that bad faith point. Um, okay. So we, we say it's not the pleaded case, it's not necessary. And the problem with including it, it it's not irrelevant because the problem with including it, it implies to the court there is a separate subsection of, of issues which are live between the parties and justified by the pleadings about the claimant's character and conduct in general. Which is not actually the position. That's that's my submission. All right, Mr. Singh. Uh, Your Honour, thank you. Uh, the, the, there are a couple of points which have been made here. In the first instance, when uh, you asked a question whether the claimant is claiming unlawful termination, Mr. Peter Lindstedt said he's no. Subsequently, said yes on the basis that he was victimized. So it is unclear as to what his case is in relation to the actual event of termination. But but coming back uh, to the fact as to why these issues are relevant, the starting point is that the defence's contention is that the 
allegations in relation to discrimination uh, and victimization, we say, are in bad faith. So then the question arises, how, what are the factual issues before the court to demonstrate that they are in bad faith? What I've very helpfully done, uh, now there might be an issue, say, look, any acts of discrimination done after the notice has been given are protected acts, and therefore the defendant has an additional burden to demonstrate that they are not protected acts. But insofar as there are acts prior to the notice of resignation, they are not protected acts, and therefore I'm fully entitled to lead evidence to show what the conduct of the person was such that it gave rise to those incidents, which then led the claimant to make those allegations. So if this is, in my mind, quite central to the whole issue of uh, you deciding, was there an act of discrimination at all? So is that your paragraph 16 in the issues? Uh, sorry? Yeah, is that, that, that what... is... Paragraph. That's what you say in paragraph 16, isn't it? In, in 14, my lord. Uh, okay. Conduct of the claimant during the course of employment. Well, 16 says, D contends that C's victimization claims are made in bad faith, the knowledge of its falsehood or with reckless disregard for truth for the reasons set out at paragraph 13. Isn't that what you've just been telling me? Uh, sorry, I've... I think, uh, let me see if I've got that right. Paragraph, there was first paragraph was para three, which uh, Council uh, Mr. Lindstedt or, uh, disagreed with. And I said, okay, I'm quite happy to reframe it as a conduct issue. And he said, okay, please do so. And I'll have a look at it. Uh, it is in para three where this was suggested. Paragraph uh, three. Yeah, the, the one which is highlighted and deleted and then reframed as uh, para 14, uh, which says. Uh, he off, uh, my my to question to you, I'm sorry, can I just go back, Mr. Singh? You told me the relevance of it, and I thought what you said to me is what is set out in paragraph 16. Yes, he contends it, it, that C's victimization claims are also made in bad faith, the knowledge of their falsehood or reckless disregard for its truth for the reasons set out at paragraph 13 of the defence. I thought that's what you said to me. That That is correct. That is what para 16 says. Well, we don't need 14 then, do we? What your, your actual case is what's in 16. Well, 16, what, what I'm saying is the principle that I've set out in 16 uh, requires the issues that need to be decided in 14. 16 can't be decided in isolation. Uh, if you don't have those issues before you, uh, going back to your earlier position that you don't need to uh, create any more issues, then how do I frame the issues to prove this point? Well... I must say, I feel like I'm wandering around in a quagmire in this, but the, what I've got from Mr. Linstead and what seemed to me to be what the pleadings were saying is that the claimant says that uh, you, the defendant, engaged in acts of victimisation, and the defendant says... Uh, those allegations, the contentions of victimisation are made in bad faith and the particulars of that are what is set out in paragraph 13. But it's not, there's not just some sort of, well, I think Mr Linstead's expression was freestanding case of do I have to decide um, whether uh, during the course of his employment the claimant demonstrate a pattern of behaviour which was disruptive, creating a bad working environment and inefficiency. I don't have to engage in that inquiry. What I have to do on your defence is to determine whether the acts of victimisation which the claimant alleges, whether those were made in bad faith. 
as set out in paragraph 13. Uh, which are foreshadowed in our defense in para 5.6, 5.17, 5.18. They are all Sorry. set out as issues. And what I've done is simply capture those issues in brief form in 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 the case memorandum. But, and I have well let me ask you a, let law. me ask you another way, please, Mr. Singh. Um, am I to do you say that at the trial I'm to conduct an inquiry into and make a decision? Uh, did was the claimant's conduct and performance during the course of his employment, so not limited to any time, not limited to any events, was his conduct and performance in the course of his employment up to the date he offered his resignation, did it demonstrate a pattern of behaviour which is disruptive, creating a bad working environment and inefficiency? Do you say that's something which I must make a finding of fact about? Uh your, your Lord, with your permission, I say that is relevant for the simple purpose. No, 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 no. My question, my question was, at the trial, yes, and after the trial, do I have to make a finding that did the claimant's conduct and performance during the course of his employment and up to the date he offered his resignation demonstrate a pattern of behaviour which was disruptive, creating a bad working environment and an efficiency. Is that a finding of fact I have to make? Uh, Your Lord, if you do not make that finding of fact on the basis of the issues framed, there is no basis on which you could conclude that he acted in bad faith and therefore the complaint was instigated, but, instigated but isn't on the yet, basis of bad okay, faith. Okay, so your answer is yes. Yes, yes, Your Lord. Uh, but... But what Mr. Lindstead says, if I understood it, is you haven't just made a general complaint in your defence that the claimant's conduct during the time of his employment um, showed, demonstrated a pattern of behaviour which was disruptive, creating a bad working environment and efficiency. Rather, Mr. Lindstedt says, is what your pleading says is that particular allegations of victimization and I think victimization were made in bad faith and somehow those are particulars of that allegation. So it's tied to particular allegations of victimization, not some general charge that during the course of his employment he engaged in bad conduct. Is that well, right? Uh, Your Honour, uh, yes, I broadly agree with your proposition, but for one, uh, say for one additional aspect to it, and, and that is, we say, uh, the pattern of behaviour uh, not only addresses the issue of whether he was victimised or he was not victimised, or whether on the, on the contrary, he found himself in a position where he's he, he thought that the allegation of victimization is the only basis of proving my claim. But secondly, the issue of discrimination can only be advanced if, if the, there are no claims uh, about misconduct against me. Because well, then it, well, you're covered by uh, paragraph 16. Paragraph 16 it, says, the defendant contends that C's victimization claims I will say made in bad faith and the knowledge of its falsehood or with reckless disregard for its truth for the reasons set out of paragraph 13. That's where, and at paragraph 13 is where you've got all these allegations of your, conduct and so your on. Honor, your Honour, all of this is set out in detail in my summary of my defence, and if you'd like, I can take you through that. No, 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 I, I want you to answer my question. Yes. Paragraph 16 is sufficient for you to put forward what you want to put forward, isn't it? That D contends that C's victimization claims are made in bad faith and the knowledge of its falsehood with reckless disregard for its truth for the reasons set out at paragraph 13 of the defence. See, Your, Your Honour, if it is limited to that, inevitably the issue of conduct that I've set out will have to be restated all over again. But aren't they set out in paragraph 13? Uh, 
paragraphs of the defense. I thought that's where they come from. And if they're not there, then they're not part of the pleading, are they? They, they, they are. They are there in the part in, in, in defense. What I've done is simply summarise them for the purpose of uh, the case management. But you've removed them in paragraph 14 from the pleading. Yeah. Paragraph 13 yeah. is tied to the acts of bad faith in alleging victimisation. Uh, and that's what you've pleaded. But paragraph 14 untethers it all and, and that, seems to invite me yeah. to engage into a general inquiry about his conduct over the course of his employment, untethered right. to the accusations yeah. of victimisation that you're addressing in 13. Your Honour, I disagree with that. It's all set out in the summary. It is not untethered. It is squarely tethered. And all, all right. I've done is set it out in detail. All right, look, where I'm going with this, Mr Linstead, I, again, I, I just think we're wasting too much time and money on this. Um, Mr Singh can have that in there if he wants. I can tell you that the fact that it's in there doesn't mean that I'm going engaging in an inquiry about those things. In the end, it's going to be the pleadings which are going to determine um, what the issues are. What I don't intend to do and what, what really what's happening today is that we're engaging in some argument about the pleadings via this list of issues. Uh, and and it, it's all, in my view, pointless. What's going to happen is this. At the trial, um, we're arguing about what the defendant contends. The defendant is going to put in, first of all, a skeleton argument. He's then going to make an opening submission. And if the defendant contends for things which either you object are not in are beyond the pleadings, or it seems to me are beyond the pleadings, then he's going to get no comfort out of saying, it was in the list of issues. Or put it another way, whatever is put in the list of issues is not expanding the pleadings. He's going to get he's not going to get a leg up by putting something into this list of issues, and in particular, um, where you flagged it. And I think that's probably important because, uh, as we know, sometimes cases can go on the basis that, uh, where at some point an objection is made that it wasn't pleaded and the other side say, oh, well, that's the way that the, the other side have agreed it could be contended uh, and say it was in the list of issues and they didn't object. Well, you have objected. It made your mark. Um, he's not going to get up simply because it was in the list of issues. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to say anything more. Uh, Your Honour, I, I fully accept all that you say. Yeah. Safe I'm just, the fact Mr. Linstead, that, uh, I'm, safe, safe just a minute, please. Just a minute, please, Mr. Yes, sir. So, sorry, Mr. I'm Linstead, sorry. I'm just not going to spend any more time on this. It's disproportionate. No, I, I fully understand that. Um, I, but, I'm but, uh, unclear whether you will be I, uh, getting... And I'm, Mr. Singh, Mr. Linstead is talking at the moment. You will talk immediately when he's finished. Yes, Mr. Linstead. It would be helpful if uh, there is an, an order or something in writing from you reflecting what you've just said. Uh, you may feel well, that's unnecessary. What, 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 what effect does this list of issues have? Well, it's an, aid. Of... it's an aid to the court. Yes. Thank you. I don't need to say anything else. I, I fully accept yep. what you've said. All right. Mr Singh, is there something you wanted to say? Uh, Your Honour, given your position, uh, I have nothing further to say. I no. guess uh, I will abide by the fact that these are mass, uh, matters which will be tested in trial. If I'm wrong in terms of what I've stated in the summary, I bring this list of issues, I suffer the consequences, uh, and I leave it at that. Yes, I, I just want to make the point clear, and I, I'll say it now, and I'm sure Mr Linstead will um, throw it back at me at trial if I forget. The, the point is this, that that the case will be decided on the pleadings. Putting some issue in a list of issues is not going to expand the the pleadings. So nobody gets to say, well, that's what the list of issues says. We'll be working on what the pleadings say. 
Thank you. Okay. I'm content with that, uh, Your okay. Honour, because uh, what it, uh, the list of issues are foreshadowed in my summary. So yeah, I'm, the, the, I, I have no issues about issues, it. Mr. You, Singh, the list uh, of issues is to assist the court. Uh, and, no, I, and, I accept uh, that. I accept and frankly, that. and frankly, the uh, assistance I'm going to get is just not worth all of this. Uh, so, my apologies, uh, Your Honour. Anything, I... anything more about this, Mr. Linstead? You were raising the issue about this list of issues. Uh, no, there's nothing further. Um, I take it that where where you had said certain points early on in the list. Uh, or should not be included. That remains the position. Uh, yes, but that's, the, that's the two right. matters we've argued. The two matters we argued about going to limitation and conduct. Those remain in, um, uh, and that's that's the position, as I understand. Yeah, and on the basis it says defendant contends, and yes. and and if at trial, counsel for the defendant says this is our case, and counsel for the claimant says. No, that's not part of your pleaded case. The defendant is going to get no assistance from saying, oh, but it was in our list of issues. Yes. Your Honour, uh, we, we do not intend to bring any list of issues before the court unless it is foreshadowing okay. the uh, uh, okay. defence. All right. Is there anything else? Uh, there are... I think two other matters to raise on right. this side. Um, first of all, it's a matter which I think uh, may be appropriate to raise in front of you. you I'm sure you'll tell me if it isn't. It is that um, this case has been running uh, in the court um, through this year. We had a hearing in uh, April in mm -hmm. front of you. And uh, the the claimant's observation is that it has not appeared on the website so judgments are not appearing on the website and hearings are not uh, appearing as publicly available um we don't know why that is oh. uh, but our understanding is that this is a public matter uh, now it is not in the small claims tribunal and therefore one would expect it to do so it, it's I make the point in particular because it seems to apply both to judgments and orders and to the videos of hearings which will one other, one would otherwise expect to see as far as we're concerned it is a public matter we'd expect it to appear in those places and therefore it seemed appropriate to raise with you uh, i don't know whether it's a matter which you have any uh um, influence in i i frankly wasn't aware of it i will make inquiries with the registry whether there is a reason for it or not Thank you. The, the second matter relates to the witnesses of the defendant. The defendant has, has indicated that it uh, may bring six witnesses. It's clearly indicated that it doesn't wish to be held to that. Uh, the claimant would like to know the identities of yes. the witnesses without holding the defendant to that. Um, certainly, it must be possible to identify the main witnesses. That would normally happen at this stage. Yes. Uh, and we'd ask, asked in this hearing if Mr. Singh could do that, because at the moment they're all anonymous. Yes. Yes, please, Mr. Singh. I, you're on it. Uh, I will endeavour to sort of identify the witnesses at the earliest. Uh, I'm sorry, me, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Could you say that again? Uh, we will endeavour to identify the witnesses at the earliest possible occasion. No, well, can you uh, do it now? You've got, you told me you've got five or six witnesses. Who are they? Um, uh, our witnesses are all our former employees. Well, what are um, their names? And, well, currently one is Tina Iscari and second is Natalie uh, Natalia Polymond, uh, the two senior associates with whom the claimant used to work. Third is Mr. Shazad Farouk, who is currently the practice manager. Fourth is Ms. Bushar Ahmed. Fifth is myself. And sixth would potentially be a lady, Maya Ahmed, who is sought as a comparator. Were you able to get those down, Mr. Lindstead? Uh, yes, I was. Could I just ask for Maya, the, the surname of Maya, the last one? Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, well, that's very helpful, Mr. Singh. Thank you. My pleasure. What, what else? Are, 
Um, could I just, my, my, my client is in Dubai, I'm in London, um, subject to quickly checking with him uh, right. that there is nothing else, uh, there is nothing else on this side. All right, we'll check with him. You can mute whilst you do that. Thank you. So I was I was muted. There is nothing further from this side. Thank you for that allowing that time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Is there anything further you would like to raise? Uh, no, thank you, madam. All right. Well, thank you both, and uh, I thank the court staff for your perseverance. And that completes today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you.